Hi, and welcome to the last episode in the Summer of 2009 Jewels of Quakerism series. Today we're going to be looking at the face of modern Quakerism in context and contrast. We'll be looking at some of the theological variations among friends and where worldwide friends can be found in what countries and what kind of concentrations. We'll also be looking at the conversations that friends have theologically and otherwise with other religious movements and other um, philosophical movements. We'll be looking for those bridges and connections so that folks who are friends or are interested in things that friends are interested in kind of know where the overlap of the Venn diagrams are, where there's some rich and fertile soil for cross-fertilization in conversation. We'll close by looking a little bit at something called convergent friends and the emergent church movement and considering some possibilities we see as the society continues to develop and have revelation uh, revealed continually. So the first thing we're going to talk about is the all of the different kinds of Quakers that exist in the world and how we got there. These Quakers are different in their theologies and the way that they worship. We'll talk about that more later. But first we're going to talk about how it came to pass that there are such a variety of Quakers. And to do that we're going to use a diagram. So up at the top of this diagram you can see that there are a variety of branches in this tree. Let's go down to the root. The origin of the Religious Society of Friends in England in the 1650s, Friends are all of one stream. And then as Friends moved to the Americas, Friends began to split apart theologically. Around the late 1820s, 1827, was the first split that's called the Hicksite Orthodox Separation. John, um, oh, rather, Elias Hicks, who was a recorded minister from Long Island, had a different view of Christ, that he wasn't born the Christ, but became the Christ by his obedience to the divine light. People who followed him put a more emphasis on the experience, left the Orthodox Quakers who put more emphasis on scripture, and there was the first split. The Orthodox dream continues up, and uh, John Joseph Gurney and John Wilbur, again, split with differences in theology, differences in emphasis on experience versus scripture, and that happened in the 1850s. John Wilbur was a New England Yearly Meeting friend. John Joseph Gurney came from Great Britain. After the Wilburite and Gurneyite split, we have some things that start to happen that are different but are uh, incredibly important. So right to the right there, there's a yellow box. This is the start of the pastoral system. And that's where we start to see friends meetings, uh, start to have uh, services, pastors leading them, uh, more sermons uh, that are prepared, hymn singing. Uh, program worship, which is much more reminiscent of the Protestant, uh, maybe Methodist or, or Presbyterian style worship with a programmed meeting. And we see a split there between uh, two forms, which later become known as FUM, which is Friends United Meeting, which is a set of programmed or semi-programmed meetings. And then down at the very bottom, EFI, e Evangelical Friends International or Evangelical Friends Church, which is um, the most programmed and most worshipfully uh, uh, reminiscent of the Protestant services. At the same time, though, the end of the 1800s, the beginning of the 1900s, we see a contingent of folks connecting from the Gurneyite movement and the Hicksite, uh, connecting out to unify, to become uh, independent or unaffiliated yearly meetings. That's a uh, Pacific yearly meeting, North Pacific yearly meeting, Intermountain yearly meeting. Those all uh, become formed out on the west coast there. On the other side, the Wilburites split in two again there in the middle of the diagram, and one half goes and joins the other piece of the Hicksites, and they become what's known as liberal friends or unprogrammed friends, an FGC, which is Friends General Conference. And the other half of the Wilburites reunites with the Gurneyites, and together they form the smallest section of friends, which is the conservative friends. And those yearly meetings, there are only three, are in Iowa, yearly meeting conservative, Ohio Yearly Meeting Conservative, and North Carolina Yearly Meeting Conservative. So the last thing to really address here uh, is the fact that we, we modified this diagram from Pacific Yearly Meeting's Faith and Practice book. And in that uh, original diagram, the suggestion was that the closer to the top of the diagram you go, the more mystical 
the practitioners are. And the closer to the bottom you get, the more scriptural or evangelical the adherents are. So the independent box would be folks that are very experiential, and the uh, EFI box would be folks that are very bound to tradition and scripture. So the, the argument that's being made there, and I think to some degree it has been both my experience and um, what I've heard from folks, is that the, the continuum from left to right or right to left is in fact fairly valid. And it's not a, um, a certain thing, it's not discrete that every one group has a certain belief that another group doesn't. Generally though, the tendency is to move towards scripture as an importance on the one side and experience on the importance on the other side. And a useful way to do this would be to talk about the far extremes. So if on one side you can imagine in terms of the experience, um, you would have uh, liberal, 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 ultra-liberal Quakers who believe that experience is, is uh, kind of before all things. And so that tends to lead towards an individualism where my experience is what's important for me and no one else can have it. And so Quakerism, while we get together in community, is a bunch of uh, me's kind of together in community and everyone has their own experience and you can't tell me what I experience because it's mine. And that is uh, an unfair, overgeneralized statement about that. But if we were at the very extremist edge of it, that's what it would sound like. On the other extremist edge of scripture being valued, it says, yes, I know you have your experiences, but what does the Holy Scripture say? Um, what, does, what does the tradition of the Christian church say? And if your experience is, kind of deviates anywhere from it, your experience is wrong. And you know, perhaps you know, um, you're wrong for having it. Again, unfair overgeneralization, but if you imagine the far, far edge of that, connection to, to tradition, connection to community, and connection to scripture, and not having as much um, experience be the kind of primary guy, that would be the far edge of it. What's interesting, and several scholars, including uh, Ben Pink Dandelion, who has written a fascinating uh, book about traditional Quakerism here called The Liturgies of Quakerism, um, he has suggested that in fact early on, um, it might be that friends um, were more of a balance in tension with both of those. So in those earliest yearly meetings, the, the content we've covered through most of this video series, early Quakers were in fact very aware of scripture and tradition and community, now was empowering, and they were also mystical in the sense of being having unmediated experience and having that be their guide. So those two things together, scripture, community, tradition, and mysticism, revelation, and experience were kind of working together in this vibrant way that was allowing people to grow. I also wanted to read a, uh, an interesting passage from the historian uh, Larry Cunning. He wrote um, for his work at the Westminster Theological uh, Abbey uh, a research on friends, and I think it's actually very telling because rather than a meta narrative of theological difference and uh, fighting, he offers a different vision of the splits in American Quakerism, and I, and I think it's it's actually very interesting to consider it. So this is from his conclusion to that paper called Quaker Theologies in the 19th Century Separations. One comes away from a study of this period with the feeling that most of the Quakers of the separation era were spiritually closer to each other than to their modern successors. Many Hicksites were not so much followers of Hicks as they were uncomfortable with the methods used to suppress him. Each party seems to foresee where the others were going. The Gurneyites towards the assimilation to generic evangelism, and then to undergo the liberal fundamentalist splintering common to all Protestants, and the Hicksites towards the loss of doctrinal boundaries and eventual amalgamation with the liberal wing, and the Wilburites towards a socially isolated traditionalism, which would eventually let down its barriers to discover the 20th century plunging ahead without asking their advice. Looking at others, each party knew it didn't want to be there and ran as fast as possible in the other direction. And while that kind of paints us as a tradition in some what negative tones or hues, I think it's really relevant that friends, even the most uh, kind of lofted names, uh, Hicks and Gurney and Wilbur, were fallible 
we are fallible people and sometimes even though we are closer to each other than um, our, we are today, we, we fight and quarrel and it ends up sending us into polarization which splits us. And so those schisms to some degree uh, seem to be a reaction to fear and a desire to have human control over a situation. And I think that Kunning in this um, article does a pretty good job of, of, of going through the steps and showing why it is that folks split. So this history and diagram that we showed you depicts the evolution and the variety of friends in North America. In fact, friends are found worldwide. And in fact, the majority of friends are actually found in Africa. The uh, evangelical strands of friends, Friends United Meeting, Evangelical Friends International, were a missional group. and have done work in Africa and also in Central and South America. So the fastest growing and some of the largest number of friends can be found in those two places, in Africa and in Central and South America. The, in fact, largest concentration of friends is found in Kenya, where more than 130,000 friends belong to Friends United Meeting in a number of yearly meetings in Kenya. There are also large growing numbers of friends in Bolivia, in Colombia, in Uruguay, part of the efforts of Evangelical Friends International to do work in and missional work in those countries. North American friends make up the spectrum of friends. There are Evangelical Friends, members of Friends United meeting, there are folks from unprogrammed conservative traditions, Hicksite friends, independent friends, all across North America. Mostly Great Britain is uh, unprogrammed friends. And um, there are dottings of friends meetings throughout Asia and South Asia, and also across Northern and Central Europe. So to quickly kind of give folks a visual run through of, of some of that information, what we'll do is we'll go through a series of images and in the images you'll see the black dots are representative of the center of the yearly meeting. So for example, when you look here at the United States, you'll see that there's black dots um, all to the east and west and then also down into Mexico. And so in North America, there's a, a fair number of folks there. In South America, you'll see it's more concentrated, obviously, towards the, the western shore. Um, and we can compare that to Europe where we have yearly meetings uh, around and spotted uh, down to the Middle East. You see there's some worship groups there, those smaller unfilled in circles. And then down to the South Asian area in India and Indonesia, you can see there's some yearly meetings. And there's one in Japan. There are some in Micronesia and in Australia and New Zealand. And then there's Africa. The huge clustering of yearly meetings there is very indicative of um, the, the burgeoning growth of Quakerism there. So those splits weren't just an abstract theological thing. Perhaps they started that way, but in the end, where we come to 2009, is the fact that those splits, to some degree, also determine the form of worship. So if we move across the spectrum again, we can see there are different kinds of things that you will encounter if you come into a friend's meeting. So uh, on the far right side, with the unprogrammed meeting, what you'll see in what's called in the United States liberal meetings, is the unprogrammed meeting for worship. The meeting house is generally uh, has some kind of a service or educational program in the morning, either for children's or adult or both. And then after that, there's usually an hour of unprogrammed meeting for worship. You'll come in and sit and it'll be silent. And the message is, at least in the United States, although to some degree we've read or heard that it's the case in the United Kingdom, that many times these messages um, can be from a variety of sources. Someone may feel led to speak and it might be from the Tao Te Ching or the Bhagavad Gita or um, any number of other sources. And while they're sometimes scripturally based, the, the organization and the individuals of the folks who are there um, tend not to be corporately Christocentric. 
they're not always um, self-identifying Christians, which um, we're not judging one way or the other. It's just, in fact, the case in contemporary North American liberal unprogrammed meetings. There's a diversity of experience and a diversity of uh, self uh, kind of identification with the Christian tradition. The um, conservative yearly meetings, while much smaller and located in Iowa and Ohio and North Carolina predominantly, um, have the same form of worship, the unprogrammed meeting for worship. However, those communities, uh, by and large, to the vast, vast majority, are self-identifying Christians and do understand the gospel to be at the core of what they're doing. They value the role of experience and are certainly mystics and are certainly claiming that tradition of revelation and the inward power of the Holy Spirit and would use those words, the Holy Spirit, Christ being crucified, taking up the cross, the, the seed of, of Christ being in there, laying down the seeds of war, and scriptural uh, literacy is, is a kind of much more valued to some degree um, within within the conservative tradition. So the worship is the same in form, however, the messages tend to come more from scriptural references and there's a common shared language that's not always uh, there within the liberal tradition. Uh, moving further to the left, we'll also see that the Friends United meetings um, have uh, some mix. So they're not a fully programmed meeting in the sense of a, a Methodist meeting or a Presbyterian, so Methodist uh, church gathering worship or Presbyterian, but it's somewhere in between the two of those. So for example, a semi-programmed meeting might have 20 minutes of service with some hymns and some preaching, and then 30 minutes of that open, open silence. Sometimes it's called communion in the manner of friends. So that big, the, that, that sacrament of joining with the divine is not always taken through the bread, you know, the wafer, but through that silent expectant waiting, that's where the communion takes place. And then at the end, maybe a benediction and um, the, then another hymn and the service ends. So kind of sandwiching that open space, that open silence in there. That's a semi-programmed meeting. And then often what a program meeting will be is, you know, preaching of more hymns, maybe a chorus singing, and maybe five or ten minutes in the middle of the, of the worship where there's a, that open expectant worship and then the rest of the service. Now, depending on the individual uh, meeting or church, friends church or friends meeting, uh, the degree to which different things happen in that expectant worship um, is significant. So for example, um, you know, in that five minutes of worship, is it true that someone could be um, raised to speak and stand as, as, as a minister and speak ministry who's not the pastor? Well, that's interesting. That would have to be a very kind of um, thorough survey to go to all the churches and find out about that. Again, the, the sketches of that and to the degree some great thinking about it has been done by B Bent Pink Dandelion in the Liturgies of Quakerism, but he certainly wasn't exhaustive about that. It, it is the case that the form looks different and to some degree um, the emphasis is more on that tradition and on the scripture and on the singing of the hymns and not on that expectant worship, just in terms of minutes used in the, in the uh, actual meeting. The movement over uh, is to more fully programmed and the evangelical tradition and there, that open space of the silence continues to um, be reduced so that we've got it there often, but it's not given half an hour or an hour, but you know, five minutes or 10 minutes. The services continue to have pastors leading them, uh, preaching, usually prepared messages, but not always. And uh, it would look more like what a traditional Protestant service would look like. What's important though, and um, what some of the research has said is that those who have been trained in the uh, manner of friends and who are serving as pastors also are very clear that the pastorship of a friend's church would be different than the pastorship of, for example, a Presbyterian church. And that is because even though the form looks radically different on one end of the spectrum as compared to the other, the fact of the matter is the spirit can in fact inform the worship in the midst of it. And so, uh, it may be that there's a prepared sermon, and it may be that there's certain hymns for the day, but as the pastor arrives and the congregation comes together, the pastor becomes clear that that day, it's silent worship. And even though there's all these songs prepared and the, church, the choir has been practicing, it is in fact for that body to enter into that open, waiting worship for that day. So the fact that that's a possibility, that that inbreaking of the Spirit could open up in a programmed um, church is in fact 
this uh, lifeline back to the original tradition that was there with early friends. And it, and it shows, in fact, that though the forms may look very different on the outside, there is this heart, there's this kernel, and this jewel of Quakerism that is, is there within all of the traditions, regardless of what their worship looks like. As we've spent this week thinking a lot about the varieties of beliefs and, and forms in the Religious Society of Friends, one of the things that we wanted to test is something that we've heard in our experience in liberal and unprogrammed Friends meetings, which is the assertion that because Friends have such a wide variety of beliefs, it's okay to believe anything. You can come in and sort of believe whatever you want, do whatever you want in a liberal friends meeting. Um, and so we included this question in our survey this week to find out the experience of friends who responded. The first is pretty um, characteristic of one of those independent meetings. It's from a friend, Pam Ryder from San Diego. That would be Pacific Yearly Meeting. And she responds, Absolutely true, we can believe whatever we want, but that does not mean that anyone other than ourself need accept or even respect that belief. I don't believe this is specific to the Religious Society of Friends. It's hard to discern because so many friends avoid discussions of belief because we don't want to judge others or be judged because of our personal perspective. I think especially this characterization that we don't discuss our beliefs with each other is very indicative of liberal and independent friends meetings. That people come to those meetings often from other traditions, perhaps where they have been wounded by uh, a theological or um, assertions that have been made in, in those other traditions. And um, they come to friends meetings not wanting to re-wound themselves or risk wounding others and so uh, hesitate from having conversations about belief, about theology, about the experience that they may be having in the meeting for worship and, um, and in so doing there's not a, uh, an understanding of what it is that friends are doing or what friends believe in, in many liberal and unprogrammed independent friends meetings. So here's Lloyd Lee's response to the question. I do not agree in any degree at all. I believe that anyone who is nurtured by the worship and other activities of a Quaker faith community should receive our hospitality, respect, and explanation of who we are and why. However, those who form the core of the community who discern and articulate who we are as a people of the faith need to be convinced of the historic position of friends as part of the unseen Christian church and be actively involved in the conversion of manners needed to live out that position in the world at large. I say need because, and need is in quotes, I say need because I believe that if there is not a core of people of like mind, no faith community of any persuasion can long endure. Friends understand that Christ has come to teach us himself. We should always be listening to what Christ has to say for us to learn in the present day. Anyone who wants to sit in on that process is welcome to do so, but not welcome to redefine the process as something else. And And I think that that is a, a emblematic of the tradition and the experience that we have had among conservative friends, that there is a strong centering on Christ, the seed and the teacher, and a strong um, discussion within the community and sharing of that belief. And uh, in contrast to the lack of discussion in liberal independent friends meetings about what it is that we believe and what it is we're doing, that there is a conversation and a collective agreement that the project, the movement, the religion that we're engaged in as conservative friends in that community of friends 
is one that grows out of an experience of Christ, the inner teacher, and um, that shared language enriches the experience of friends in the meeting. So one of the things that we wanted to do in this video is give folks some kind of indication in terms of where this communication and where the conversation can go. So we want to try and draw some bridges to contemporary experience of other traditions. So friends have been articulated historically and to some degree contemporarily within this video and in our series. And we want to say, what are some of the other conversations going on in the world around us that uh, allow us some bridging or some dialoguing? Um, in the sense of Venn diagrams, if Quakerism here, you know, where are the other folks that overlap us and, and in what regard and in what way do they overlap? And so to do that we want to talk about mysticism because mysticism is in fact the core, at least from our perspective, of what Quakerism offers, which is that there is a direct unmediated experience with the divine and that experience is at the core of what continuing revelation is, what the silent meaning for worship is, and in fact what the capacities of Quaker ministry is about. And that means mysticism. Mysticism is the individual's experience with the divine. And Quakerism is often defined by theologians who care to define us as a corporate mystic practice. That is, in the meeting for worship, together we are all gathering trying to have this communal experience of the divine, this communion in the manner of friends in the silent waiting worship. And so it's um, useful to think about who some of the other mystics are in the world around us and, and where some of those theological conversations could take place. So uh, the fact is that there are some folks today who also continue to believe that the gifts of the Spirit are poured out and available. Uh, the Mormons, the Church of Latter-day Saints, also believe in the possibility of prophetic speech, and they have their own uh, prophets, and that sense of prophetic speech is very much aligned along with traditional understanding of friends. Again, their form of worship looks very different. Uh, their proselytizing and evangelism looks significantly different than most branches of friends. However, there's this theological overlap that's there. The United Church of Christ, for example, also has this understanding, though they don't name it as such, something very akin to continuing revelation. The truth is revealed and will continue to be revealed as we are faithful. And they've actually done a very clever series of billboards all over different parts of the United States that say, uh, don't put a period where God put a comma. God's still speaking. And that is, of course, very much aligned with the Quaker idea of continuing revelation. That truth will continue to be revealed by the Holy Spirit. Um, and we will learn and grow into faithfulness and together walk with uh, each other closer to the peaceable kingdom. Uh, another group of folks that's certainly worth taking a look into is the Catholic mystics. And while the Catholic tradition itself is informally set up as a corporate form of mysticism like um, the Religious Society of Friends, the Catholics certainly have had their share of mystics. Um, Teresa of Avila, uh, St. John of the Cross, there are names within the Catholic um, tradition that were certainly mystics, that certainly did a lot of writing about it, and um, many of those folks have been sainted at this point. Um, so the, it's important to know that there are Catholic traditions with which there's some dialogue and folks in, within the Catholic tradition who understand mysticism as a uh, viable uh, spiritual path. Also, um, branching out from uh, Christianity, many of the uh, pagan faiths as well as the Druidic traditions have lots of understanding of their individual capacity to commune with spirit and obviously now since we have stepped away from Christianity to some degree there is a significant um, shift in terms of the fact that it's not the Holy Spirit per se historical it's not the historical Holy Spirit uh, which the, the the Druidic and the pagan traditions are referencing but it, there may be some fertile room for dialogue with folks to say what is your experience of communion with the divine what is that like and there may be some interesting conversation that can happen there. Similarly, the Sufi faith, which is a subset of uh, Islam, is a very mystical tradition. They're small, as is Quakerism, and the Sufi tradition uh, brings us the poet Rumi, who is the world's most uh, purchased poet, 13th century poet, and he's a um, Sufi mystic who wrote about God in these loving, connective, desirous ways, and Rumi is a Sufi. And the Sufi tradition still exists today, mostly in the Middle East. And these are some Muslim folks who are also very clearly mystical and are interested in having connection with the divine unmediated. 
So I'm, I'm, I mention all of these things, and we want to make sure that folks have heard about some of these different kinds of uh, connections, and I'm sure there's many more, so that uh, we are clear in our statement saying we would love for more conversation to be taking place, not just within our meetings, but ecumenically and interfaith. It's important in the days and years and months coming ahead that the people of faith have conversations and connections with each other. Quakerism, to some degree, has become insular in certain places, and it needs to break out of that, we feel. It needs to be talking to each other in very powerful ways and talking to other traditions and getting ourselves grounded in the world so that we can be in the world but not of it. We can become faithful, guided people, doing what we need to to live faithful lives, also understanding that they're the wounded world of which we are part. And so we really want to encourage folks to, to find ways to have those conversations, to share those deep experiences that they have with other folks and help to draw out those experiences from other people so that we can come to know each other and that which is eternal and have conversation which is full of, of that living water. And in the vein of that conversation, there's some very exciting things happening, in fact, within the religious tradition of the Society of Friends itself. Within the Religious Society of Friends, one place where this dialogue and sharing is happening is a conversation named Convergent Friends. And it, it brings together friends from several different branches having these conversations about what they believe and its richness. Probably the most succinct way to describe it is to share a definition of who Convergent Friends is. And this is from Robin Moore, who does a lot of writing in her blog on the internet about Convergent Friends, and she's a friend from San Francisco Monthly Meeting and Pacific Yearly Meeting, and she writes, Convergent describes friends who are seeking a deeper understanding of our Quaker heritage and a more authentic life in the kingdom of God on earth, radically inclusive of all who seek to live this life. It includes, among others, friends from the politically liberal end of the evangelical branch, the Christian end of the unprogrammed branch, and the more outgoing end of the conservative branch. It includes folks who aren't sure that what they believe about Jesus and Christ, but who aren't afraid to wrestle with this question. It includes people who think that a lot of Quaker anachronisms are silly, but who are willing to experiment to see which are spiritual disciplines that still hold life and power to transform and to improve us. Metaphorically, it suggests that friends are moving closer towards some common point on the horizon. Put otherwise, I would say that the winds of the Spirit are blowing across all branches of friends, blowing us in the same direction. The convergence of friends is a fuzzy, changing concept, not an example of pure mathematics and philosophy. I want to share right here a little bit from another friend, Wes Daniels, who happens to be a pastor of a friend's church in Oregon from a very different tradition than Robin, who's from an unprogrammed independent meeting in San Francisco. He is also part of this convergent conversation. And he writes about who are the convergent friends. We are unprogrammed, programmed, liberal, evangelical, post-liberal, moderates, post-evangelical, emerging postmodern Christian seekers, young and old, we are people who have grown tired of the old categories and the lack of creativity in our tradition that it has found itself in. We're bothered by the absence of a relevant Quaker message in the world, and we like to use whatever means possible to share our ideas and to connect. And I think it's this emphasis on connection and the sharing ideas of ideas that characterizes the convergent movement and the conversation that's happening across branches, the willingness to, to wrestle with and to share traditions and, and find out what has life and power and to share that with each other, what it is to live in the kingdom of God today. This is the conclusion for now of the Jewels of Quakerism series for the summer of 2009. It's been really a wonderful gift to be able to share our experience both in these classes and on the internet and with the surveys in, in a large dialogue about the Religious Society of Friends and the jewels that are to be found here. 
We encourage folks to go to the uh, Quaker Quaker website. You can go through that link right there to go find some other information. There's conversation there, there's some forums, there's some blogs, the surveys will remain open. You can read all the old surveys. There's a rich body of experience and information there. And we would love folks to make use of it in whatever way that they find possible. We think that the conversation is incredibly important and digging into some of these, ju these juicy pieces is uh, going to be part of what's the way forward, we think. Carry this into your own meetings, into uh, the gatherings in your own living room, over cups of coffee or tea with each other. Start conversations, share your own experience. Begin those dialogues about um, what it's like for you to be um, wrestling with these questions in the Religious Society of Friends. Uh, what is it like to live for uh, today in these times into the kingdom? And while we spent a lot of time in this series on history, it's important to understand that in this last episode, in fact, one of the jewels of Quakerism is you. It's your experience and your understanding of how it is the Spirit is moving in the world. And we hope you share it. Thanks.